a small 484 locomotive built with nothing but Timken roller bearings at Demonstrator, and they let various railroads try it. Take it, so see what you think. You know, use it for six months, and mechanical officers around different railroads started saying, wow, this is a lot better than friction bearings. And it was a, a wonderful marketing scheme, doubled by the fact that they, they were clever enough to give it the number 1111. So immediately got the nickname Four Aces, it's kind of catchy. And then they staged in Chicago in front of the Santa Fe building, three secretaries in high heels pulling the locomotive with tow ropes on, on the dead level ground. <laughs> That's, I, I, get, I gotta stage that picture one of these days. I need three ladies who actually own a pair of high heels. <laughs> I got the rope. <laughs> Which meant now that it was time to put those big, lovely side rods back on. That came as part of the package when they put the roller bearings on. They got lightweight uh, side rods made with fancy metals that weren't available to the railroads during World War II. The good nickel steels and stuff like that, you're not using that for a locomotive. That's for armor plating on a tank or a battleship or something like that. You got to use mild steel. And they did. But the lightweight side rods, now you got a problem. Conceive of those big 80 inch wheels with crank pins that have to be in perfect time. And you've had the, the rods off for a while, so they may not be in perfect time by the time it's time to put the side rods back on. And once again, you have to capture both crank pins at the same time. You can't get it on one and walk it onto the other. So we have an unnamed PhD in our group who is calculating how to put jacks under the axle and push up against these enormous leaf springs to lift an axle off the ground so we could put come-alongs on the wheel and, and turn it until the two crank pins were the right distance apart. And I was explaining that to an 85-year-old visitor who had been an engineer running the machine as a young man. He started to laugh. He says, Dad, eh, just use wedges. And I said, Glenn, wedges? He said, yeah, you know, a piece of steel. There's nothing down here that's about two inches over there. And the bells went on. You take a wedge like that and you lay it on the rail and you pull the locomotive so a wheel climbs that wedge, it'll turn a slightly different distance than the one in front and the one behind. And when they're just right, Except for Glenn, thank God. Which got us to the cross ends. Now this is a this is a pain in the butt here to work on because it's heavy. At the front end of the locomotive, there is a linear bearing called a cross head, which supports a shoe that holds the butt of the piston coming in and out of the steam cylinder. And they're lined with back, the shoe and the cross head, and they're fluted. So you see multiple bearing surfaces on the same shoe. This is an aluminum shoe turned upside down. It weighs about 90 pounds. And I didn't know anything about Babbitt, so I looked it up. And Wikipedia said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I started looking at prices, and it turns out the one we needed only cost $20 an ounce. <laughs> and we needed 501 ounces. Uh, <clears throat> and we didn't really know how to put it on. It turns out that the Grand Canyon Railroad has a steam shop with an absolutely Prussian machinist who was going to do the work for us. So they built molds and cast new Babbitt onto these surfaces and then milled it out to the original specifications. So those bearings are perfect. And they have to be. At 90 miles an hour, which is the design cruising speed for this machine, that bearing slides down and back 32 inches more than six times a second. It's being pushed with 225,000 pounds in each direction. It can't be flawed in any way. It has to be in perfect tram, and it has to be really slippery smooth. Oh, yeah, that way. So right. remounted, you can see with some effort, it's slippery smooth. See the wire? 
You have to tram these things so that, that, it, that when you mount the shoe and then the big bracket that holds the butt of the piston to the main driving rod, that the whole thing slides back and forth perfectly. There can't be any sideways thrust. Uh, this, this, of all the bearings in the whole locomotive, this is the one that's got to be perfect. Thank God for Thomas the Machinist. And for some of our bright guys who figured out how to do the tramming and the alignment of this system, basically with the old piano wire technique, find the dead center of the cylinder at both ends, make a straight line down the middle all the way to the back end, and make sure that when you slide that shoe back and forth, it maintains that line perfectly. It took a little while to get that right, but we did. And the fun thing about that was, the same bright boys realized we needed to hone out the cylinders. They'd been used for a long time. There was some pitting. Tits don't bother you too much in a steam cylinder. Ridges are a disaster, though. Ridges catch the rings and rip them apart. Little tiny pits, it's just a steam looking. It's not the space shuttle. Well, there's several ways you can try to hone out those steam cylinders. This is not one of the more effective ones. Uh, it, wait a minute. The hone has to go straight down the middle. But we already know that the crosshead and the shoe that it carries are perfectly in tram. So all you do is have your bright boys build their very own hydraulically driven hone. You can't buy a 28 inch diameter hone effectively, but you can make one and you know it's perfect because it's sliding on the same bearing that's got to be perfect to begin with. At any rate, the uh, inside of the cylinders is now polished beautifully. We got that many jobs done, but literally, this is a do-it-yourself project. Now, watch this little boy just pull back. You can see the crosshead and his shoe sliding back and forth right there. We, we admire that view. You get to see it on the way in. We'll get back to some of them funny looking rods that go off in every direction. They actually all have a name. For a while we called this one a banana. It's actually called a union link. Back inside the boiler. I want you to see that we're in the boiler looking at the back of the locomotive and you can see that something is suspended with all these rods. There are those stay bolts and stay rods I was talking about. This is the pattern. And Oh my, every one of those has to be good too. Well, it turns out that the ones that are flexible live underneath a little sleeve and there's a, it looks like a screw head, it's not actually, um, that is allowed to articulate and wiggle and wobble around on the inside. So it does have some motion as the boiler expands uh, with the heat. Uh, there are several thousand of them. We had to do repairs on more than a thousand of these things. Uh, it turns out the hardware to do the repairs was costing us on the order of uh, $75 each. And the welding time for one of these things is about an hour of $75 an hour welding each. And the old ones that were nasty and rusted had to be cut off so that we could put a sleeve down over the top of them, weld it on, and put it in cap on top of that. I'll walk you through the process here. Uh, you get a big, heavy box uh, from the freight people and our hardware is, of course, little cylindrical sleeves. But guess what? Because that boiler has an arch to it, you got to cut them off at a specific angle for each position on the arch. It took a little calculating. And you wind up with the blank and then one that's trimmed for a specific row. That actually looks like row two, uh, from my sad experience of seeing one. This I love. How do you get a 30 degree, let's do that again. That was so much fun. How do you get a 30 degree bevel cut on this rim so that the welder can do a full penetration well? You have to grind it down, and our welders are picky. So one of our machinists invented this stupid looking gizmo. You chuck up in the lathe, and there's a couple of different linkages in here that can be adjusted so that this is rotating in the same plane. Then the fun part starts after that. where you want it, you go back out with the grinder. And why you usually wind up doing this with the grinder, I don't know. It's not necessary, but it makes good volume. <laughs> and when you've got a 30 degree bevel, rinse and repeat a thousand more times. Uh, what a joy it is. Uh, it turns out we got some help with this project. Of the 